said yet again by the Pharisees, and uh, we are reminded with the disciples once again that God calls us to let the children come to him. So we'll explore the ways that we're called to be inviting and welcoming to all of God's children. I thought you'd think we wanted to fight your hearts and minds and we prepare for worship and meditate. one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, by the God's strength, we gaze upon the abundance of Jesus Christ. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin and the grace of God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love, love our neighbors as ourselves. 
All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. And speak to God. Thank you. 
And whatever the man called her the living creature, that was its name. The man gave these to all cattle, and to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. For the man, there was not allowed to help but was his God. So the Lord God had once a deep sleep to call upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs, so his face was flushed. And the rib that the Lord had God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones, the flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called a woman, for all the man this one has taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother, clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. Will it die? Will it die? sanctified and those who are sanctified 
all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Word of God, word of life. <laughs> Christ Jesus, who unites us. Amen. So uh, I, was, I was out roller skating in the park with, with my wonderful spouse recently, and we thought we'd be gross and cute and hold hands that we, we were <laughs> Out of nowhere, an officer stops us and begins writing us a citation. I'm shocked. We're at the park. Skating is allowed. We aren't harming anyone. But then the, quick, the officer quickly informs us that we're in violation of Metro National Code of Ordinance, Chapter 12.58.030, which states that persons operating scooters, inline skates, or roller skates shall operate such scooters and skates in a single file. It's real. <laughs> He went on to say, skating side by side is a crime punishable by a fifty dollar fine and a mark on our criminal record. <laughs> that we have clearly violated the letter of the law. I mean, come on, the letter of the law? I get those scooters downtown could be a nuisance, but it's not like we're skating down the sidewalk on Broadway. No one, no one else was around. And besides, I've seen people zipping around on those freaking scooters in skates. Not in a single file, hundreds of times committing this crime. How can this be fair? If you haven't guessed, full disclosure, that didn't actually happen. <laughs> but the ordinance and the fine are very real. And occasionally, Becky and I do skate not a single file. But we have lots of laws on our books, just like this one, that, that aren't enforced because the spirit of the law no longer applies to the letter of the law. 
We can define the letter of the laws as any formal code or rule or regulation or principle that must be followed according to governmental mandates or policies. In short, it's the law as it is written. In the US, such letters of the law range from stop at a stop sign to do not murder another person. All these laws are in place to serve, to maintain, to protect the public welfare in one way or another. But far more complicated and something that isn't really codified is the spirit of the law, which we can define as, as social norms and moral consensus of the interpretation of that letter of the law. In a paper titled, The Letter Versus the Spirit of the Law, Matthew Gordon describes the space between the letter and the spirit of the law as a, as a buffer zone. And points out how this buffer zone varies based on the societal norms. He writes, social norms would arguably consider a law against murder to be absolutely legitimate, important, and inviolable, whereas social norms regarding jaywalking would be less legitimate, less important, and more readily viable. Consequently, in the case of murder, the buffer zone would be virtually, if not completely, non-existent, whereas that buffer zone would be very large in the case of jaywalking. Thus, because social norms differ depending on each particular law, the severity of the action being prohibited, the context, the culture, etc., so too will the buffer zone between the letter and the spirit. However, it's important to note that even in cases where the letter and spirit are perfectly aligned, as in capital murder, the letter and spirit are nevertheless conceptually distinct. In our gospel lesson for today, we find a group of Pharisees who have come to test Jesus to get his take on the, the buffer zone around divorce laws. We've clearly had some time since then, and our norms and morals are, are certainly different than what they were in Jesus' time. So let's take a moment to examine the context of this debate. The question posed to Jesus is the very question that led to the beheading of John the Baptizer by Herod Antipas, who coincidentally happens to rule the region that Jesus and the disciples had just traveled to. It's not a, a new question for Jesus, and it was actually an ongoing controversy among competing factions and schools of thought that predate Jesus. So part of this test is, is that any answer is likely to offend someone and the wrong answer could lead to death. Decades before Jesus' incarnation, kingly bodily presence, arguments ranged over what instances a man was allowed to divorce his wife. The Mishnah, the first major written collection of the Jewish oral traditions, recorded the arguments of Hillel and Shammai, who both lived prior to Jesus. To have grounds for divorce, Shammai says a man has to have witness or have credible witnesses that attest that his wife being improperly clothed and trying to attract attention or being fully naked in front of other men. The disciples of Hillel held that an insignificant matter such as not cooking well constitutes naked behavior. Jesus' teachings on divorce throughout the gospel actually seem to side with the more stringent Shammai. Here, though, Jesus isn't setting a new law. He's, he's warning the situation of divorce. His response moves beyond a legalistic approach to questions of divorce uh, toward a, a theological affirmation about God's purposes for marriage in the context of God's inbreaking brain. In Jesus' day, when a woman received a, a certificate of divorce, she lost most of her rights, like the right to own property. She could easily find herself begging for food on the street or taking on sex work for income. Clearly, Jesus has a, a pastoral concern for women who could have their very lives torn apart by a signature on a piece of paper. 
The seemingly harsh response points to the image of God in creation. The Pharisees point to Deuteronomy, and Jesus replies with Genesis, going all the way back to the primordial of the human being. Beyond the situation at hand, we can safely assume that Mark wouldn't have written to the early church about the consequences of divorce if Christians weren't already practicing it. Both Jesus and Mark are addressing a culture that fails to provide a safety net for the divorced woman. They didn't have alimony or, or really any means for legal recourse. So all this teaching may sound relentlessly harsh next to what's permissible in the letter of the law. We can see that Jesus' intent is the protection and honor of the spouse as a child created in God's image, not as an object that can be discarded on a selfish point. The spirit of this law of unity, then, is the unfolding reign of peace, love, and justice. My friend and theologian, Cory Driver, notes the poetic unity of God's reign by exploring what he calls the, the splitting of the primordial human. This is a, a really kind of intense uh, concept, so, so stick with me. Stick with me. In his response, Mark, Jesus cited and spoke about uniting languages four times. Uh, he says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Most Christian readers will miss the point of what Jesus is referencing here. Jewish accounts of creation hold that the original humans were undifferentiated mixtures of male and female. This may be a new concept, but it's the plain reading of the first several chapters of Genesis. The human, Ha-Adam, was created male and female. When a human was split in two sides, all of a sudden, and for the first time, there were separate male and female humans. In Genesis chapter 2, the event is described with the word Salah which is most often used in the rest of the biblical text to refer to a side of a building, such as a temple. Adam, the man, notes that he has been stripped of a side of his previously mixed-sex body. And not just a rib, as he exclaims, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. When God created humans during the first week of creation, there were mixed sex. And the ongoing work of creation, separated male and female individuals were created by undoing the primordial <laughs> oneness. Ancient Jewish texts make this point explicitly. When the Blessed Holy One created Adam, he created him androgynous. As it is written, he created them male and female, named them Adam. And again, it is written, and God created man in his own image. And it is written, male and female, he created them. How is this to be understood? In this way, in the beginning, it was the intention of God to create two human beings. And in the end, only one human being was created. For it concludes, Jesus points to marriage as a mystical undoing of the splitting of the primordial human and a reuniting of the two into one. Somehow, marriage returns two humans to the unity of the sixth day of creation that was a part of God's exceedingly good creation. By referencing the two becoming one flesh in his answer to the Pharisees' question on divorce, Jesus trumps any argument about Mosaic law by describing not just idyllic life in the garden, but life at the height of the goodness of the first My friends, we hear the good news this week, that the spirit of God's law is unity. Unity with one another, and unity with the divine. Jesus' teachings and actions here are revolutionary, subverting both cultural and legal presuppositions about women and children. Jesus makes it clear that we can't fulfill the letter of the law 
that leads to this unity on our Instead, Jesus calls us to be like children in receiving God's kingdom. Children who are the least valued and most vulnerable members of society are nevertheless welcomed by Jesus. In the waters of baptism, Jesus has taken each of us into his arms, has blessed us, and united us with God. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. May it be so. Revive declining species and preserve endangered lands. 
cultivate in us a wonder for the world you created. God, in your mercy. You desire for us not to be alone and to live in community with one another. Strengthen relationships between nations and peoples that we celebrate and support in one human family. God, in your mercy. You share in our experiences and struggles. Bless all who live with any mental or physical disability. Inspire creative communities, spaces, and environments that are accessible and hospitable. Strengthen those in need, especially those we know by name. The Colin family, Wes, the Berkeley family, the Dorn family, Stephen, Shannon, and George. God in your mercy. You have established and nurtured relationships that extend beyond those gathered here today. Bless members who can no longer travel to worship with us and remind us of their continued role in this community of faith. God in your mercy. You promise eternal life to all your children. Thank you for the people of faith who have gone before us. Strengthen our trust we have in you. God, in your mercy, you are heard. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Do not fail the offering of our lives to nourish the world we love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. Rightly, we give you thanks and praise, gracious God, for whom and through whom all things exist. Because he made us a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and honor. Long ago, you spoke to us through the prophets, but now you have revealed yourself through your Son, heir of all things, reflection of your glory, and the exact imprint of your very being. Through him, you sustain all creation by your powerful word. In him, you made purification for sins, as your servant, he tasted death for everyone. And so we gladly thank you, with saints and angels and the whole host of heaven, singing your eternal song. <laughs> this holy meal and your company, show us Jesus today. In the midst of this congregation, raise up your spirit of love and joy and peace. Send that same spirit on this bread and wine that it may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take me, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And after he gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Transform. 
morning, God, is it all today who dwell in the throes of suffering, sorrow, pain, or distress? Give them courage to withstand and patience to persist. Take away all that would prevent your children from coming to you, and give your church grace to receive your kingdom like a little child. Receive into your arms of mercy any who have been dismissed or excluded or treated as objects of shame. Melt all hardness of heart into the wonder of a people united in your inseparable love. Until heaven and earth are joined in the banquet of your glory, ever one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Gathered in one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy eyes the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for our ever. Amen. Kevin, already I'm ready now to take out your elegance. All the workers come to the table. Together we share the bread. The body of Christ. Yeah. 
Thank you. 